you're describing our experience in Korea and how that influenced us as, as architects. But what it did is we came back to the, the states and began to look at other church designs. We realized that uh, we need to approach every project, first of all, with that kind of uh, uh, excitement, that kind of a blank slate. But, but more than that, it made us question all of our assumptions that we'd brought forward as our, in our experience as architects, especially working with churches. Uh, and that was kind of a, uh, an impetus to us to, to rethink the church, churches we design, not just to design today, but what would they be like in the future, 10, 12 years from now in the U.S.? Because obviously all of us who work with churches know the kind of cultural shifts we're facing, just not just here in the U.S., but within the church itself, the kind of uh, missional changes that churches are experiencing. And uh, so we wanted to relate to that. We wanted to go back and explore that. So that, that kicked off in January of this year, uh, a year-long investigation we decided to undertake. Uh, and the first half of that year, essentially, of this year was spent talking to people like Toby right here, church leaders, uh, thinkers around the country, as well as people on the technical side of life, like Craig, Acoustic Dimensions, uh, people in the building industry. Uh, again, understanding not so much the what, but what buildings would be, but what would the church be? Because again, that was one of the lessons from Korea. Yeah. Understanding who you are is essential to, to defining that space for you. Uh, we're not going to spend the session today going through uh, kind of the download of our research. We're going to show you the results of that and also spend some time dialoguing. But we did want to show you just a brief uh, movie clip here that's going to condense our research into about a minute, uh, yeah. six months into a minute. Yeah. The last quote there uh, from Leadership Network uh, actually was one of the groups that assisted us in this research, but uh, I think it really states the heartbeat of a lot of the pastors we talked to. This struggle with what, how mission relates to building uh, and understanding exactly, again, uh, what the church needs to be. Uh, and uh, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking to Toby here. Uh, some of the same questions we asked him in our initial interviews, additional thoughts he may have had since then. but. But Toby, I remember one of the first questions I asked, again, what, what is it that you see coming uh, in the next few years, the next 10 years, relative to trends in the church, and, and how does the church need to respond to be relevant to those? I, well, I think one of the things, if you, without really over cliching it, is I think the church is moving from, especially to reach the next generation, it's moving from, an, from an, like an institutional mindset to more of a movement mindset. And uh, I think one of the words that's way overused, it's, but I think it's true, is the word missional. And I think when you look at ministry, it's gonna be more than just a place to gather as it relates to a building. It's gonna be a launching place to make a difference in the community. I think when we think about buildings, we used to think about how can we build a big enough space to get enough of our people together on Sunday, as opposed to thinking how can we design places where ministry can be launched out? I think that's going to be a significant part of what happens moving forward. The next generation that I work with has no interest in being part of an institution. They want to be a movement. They want to make a difference. Uh, I tell our church all the time, I, I live in a little town called Denton, which has one of the largest public universities in the state. You've never heard of it because the football team's not any good, but it's a big <laughs> school. Yeah. 
and I can I can step onto that campus and I can go raise twenty thousand dollars today in quarters if I had the right cause, you know. And it really doesn't matter what the cause is. It's uh, they can you know, hug a tree, save a dog, whatever. <laughs> uh, but this next generation wants to be a part of a movement, wants to be a part of sensing they're doing something different. And I think the church is going to be. We know we have the greatest cause, the kingdom cause, and we're going <clears> to <throat> capture that for the cause of the kingdom. And I think when we look at buildings, we're going to look at it like that. How can we design space mm. more than just a place for people to gather, but a way we can push <coughs> kingdom causes in our communities, dreams of mm. partnering with other faith-based nonprofit organizations to, to feed people, uh, to take care of people. Right. I think that's to be a part of it. And then I think the other thing that has yet to be explored is in this information age people are communicating more and connected less than they've ever been and i i believe tom and i talked about this a long time i think there'd be a huge backlash i think we weren't created just to communicate but to connect at a different level and mm. i fight with our youth pastors all the time about what they say connection is and I, I just don't think twitter is connecting i think it's communicating and so i think the church's response is going to be designing places where people can connect but i think Tom, it really a whole different way. I don't know. I hesitate to use this word, but a whole different way of the business of church, of what it's been in the past. It's just mm. I think it's going to look a lot different. I think we're going to accomplish more. The kingdom is going to advance more, but it's not going to be what I grew up in. Mm. That's what I think. Yeah. Give us a, a flavor of what you think some of the the kind of the common activities or functions of the church are changing too. And an example I'm thinking of is. Uh, how you teach learning or what, how you think about learning in a church environment versus just sitting in a Sunday school class and how that's going to impact the way we do church. Well, I hope a part of it is that we, we learn that we grow by doing, not just by sitting. Craig has a lot of opinion on this. We've talked about it before. <laughs> As a guy who's a pastor, is used to people sitting in rows and yeah. receiving. I think there's going to be more interactive ways of learning together. Uh, I don't want to offend anybody, but I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna redefine sacred space, <laughs> and yeah, what sacred yeah. space is, yeah. and what that means. And I think there's been a, a, I'm all for sacred space. I'm just not sure I agree with what everybody's definition of sacred space is, <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. kind of redefining what it means to be a follower of Christ, and, and the church being the place where people get to practice that, not just hear about it, and then go back out and live their lives. And I think we're gonna have to think about it. I think we're gonna think hard about it in the years to come. Yeah, we're gonna come back to the sacred space question. I just thought I'd together. launch it out there. Just yeah, good job, yeah. get it out there. <laughs> Keep it stirred up. Keep it stirred up. Uh, one last one, uh, metaphor for the future church. Epicenter of the community. I, I really do, I think it's gonna be this, I think the heart of the church is going to be a place, and I think this this is kind of nothing new under the sun. Yeah. I mean, back the, the stories my great grandparents told me was about the church was the place, the first place you went for all kinds of things. Right. And I think that's what's going to happen in the church instead of allowing it's going to be the central epicenter place where kingdom life it flows out, as opposed to simply a place to meet. I know that's oversimplifying it, but yeah. I think it's going to be a bigger deal than that. Mm. Very good. We've got a church for you, by the way, coming up. Yeah. All right. I'll show you a building. <laughs> okay. Let's get into the architecture then. And, and, and really from conversations like this, which is just some uh, amazing, rich conversations with a lot of leaders around the country, uh, we tried to distill what are, what are some of the common elements that are showing up there, as well as what are some of the things out on the edge. What are the fringe things that, that we're hearing that maybe we discard because they don't fit in our, uh, in our neat uh, box? Uh, but from that, Michael and I are going to share a few of the ideas that begin to, to boil up as important to express and whatever that future de church design was. Right. Yeah. yeah, one of the first things we debated was, is the building the church? And we kept coming back to, you know, the building isn't the church. It's no longer the church. So really the church is software and the building is hardware. So you think about hardware, well hardware, the Apple II, right? <laughs> that was hardware. Apple moved way beyond that, the software's moved way beyond that. Uh, 
we're now to devices you know that we can't even dream of. This is the uh, iPad 10, by the way, guys. We're giving you a sneak peek. Yeah, don't tell anybody you've seen it here. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. But but uh, hardware yeah. needs to be updated constantly to keep up with the software. The spaces then that we 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 heard that did have some common uh, resonance, I think, were that of uh, spaces for celebration. Still, certainly, as a heartbeat of the church, worship areas, space for connection, and Toby already alluded to that. Right. Uh, and connection, not just at a at a Sunday school level, a one way communication, but how technology and other things that are going to afford a different kind of connection that people can can get. Again, outsiders coming into the church as well as those within the church. Right. And then the idea of community as well. And really, again, some of those the spaces then, or buildings uh, relative to that, or big buildings that are would have these kind of three qualities. And the ideas we're going to show you later, all of them represent some aspect of these. And I hope you pick that up through all of them. Yeah. The idea of, of, of a communal building, again, that, that fosters community. But community more than just as we think of it now in a lot of respects with church buildings, not just a coffee shop or a bookstore or a gymnatorium or a sanctanasium. Uh, it, it's something that, that really engages Sanctum the community. Sanctanasium. Sanctanasium. It's a technical term. Can't Sorry. a gymnatorium sanctanasium? Yeah. You guys haven't heard of this term? It's an architect's term. We it's didn't make up this term, term, did we, guys? Yeah. <laughs> But the idea, again, that a building uh, uh, is, is, again, as Toby, Toby, Toby alluded to, maybe it's a launching pad. Uh, another pastor referred to it as an aircraft carrier. Yeah. That's what we're here, preparing to launch people for ministry. Right. Uh, the idea that it's sustainable, and certainly that's a term that's a buzzword in the architectural industry relative to green building ideas, and that, that's part of it. But also that's something that's viable, that even could be a model to the community of yeah. so, a new idea of, of, of self-supporting. Yeah, stewardship. More the renewable energy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so you're going to see a lot of actually some technology showing up in those ideas too relative to sustainable uh, building ideas. Yeah. Then the last one, adaptability. Uh, and this is, was a real important one. Uh, uh, you, you see churches today and how they're having to adapt to their environments globally as well as here in the U.S. Uh, you can see that it's getting harder and harder, frankly. And, and the kind of ideas we thought of as buildings before don't fit real well, the model. Let's yeah. say... You know, one of the trends the last 10 years, I, th think, I've, I, I think I heard this one, uh, over 200 congregations have been planted in New York City the last 10 years. But where do those churches go? It's a big problem. Uh, how do you adapt to an urban environment? How does a church in a developing country, and, and Christianity is exploding around the world, how do they adapt to in a global environment? Yeah. So this idea of adaptability is, is something that was important relative to the building systems, uh, relative to how ministry is done. Right. So some things we're going to show here. Some things too about it's really hard to predict the future. And if you look back 10 years at what, what was going on then, what we had as far as technology, how fast things have changed. It's just changing that much more rapidly. <clears throat> so some of the ideas you're going to see, we really tried to push the designers to think beyond just what we know now. Yeah. Yeah. So along this idea of adaptability, we thought of the church really existing in different places and what might it look like as it adapts to that environment. So we have three or five areas we're going to show you. One is uh, an urban setting, one is a global setting, one is a found space, which we'll explain more in a minute, a rebirth space, which is taking an existing church facility and repurposing it, and then the idea of a, a flexible building or a flexible place. Right. This was the team at, at Beck that undertook this, and, and we realized too, Michael and I, that this is a much larger issue. It's interesting too to get the perspectives of others. You can see a pretty good generational difference here, experience difference, cultural difference, and how that enters the discussion, which again is relevant to, to where we are now here in the U.S. in the church. The way we treated it too, we had 10 designers. Tom and I acted as editors, um, and then we actually had our boss, Rick Del Monte, Asked him if he wanted to be an editor or a designer. Well, he wanted to be a designer. He wanted to jump in and do it. So he took yes. one of them over his, as yes. his pet project. Yes. <laughs> didn't edit so. that one very much, did you? We didn't edit that one very much. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great idea. <laughs> He's listening online, so right, Rick? Yeah. Great idea. <laughs> First, the idea of the rebirth church. And again, we see our, our communities filled with these, right? I don't know. You may be worshiping in one right now. It's a building that might have been done in the 40s or the 50s uh, and was built around a denominational idea or an idea of Sunday school and, and uh, those kind of uh, activities. It was a neighborhood church. 
That was the idea. Yeah. But our communities have these everywhere. Yeah. We've seen though, you know, the last 10, 20, 30 years with the, the growth of the mega campus, mega church ministries, how those, a lot of those are, have been vacated, empty, quite frankly, or they're underused, uh, right. poorly utilized. Uh, and for churches now that seem to have a, a passion to be back in communities and developing that, we thought what a great, again, launching pad right. to be right back in the community. But how do you use these buildings designed around 1950s ideas for 2022 ministry? Right. If you look at the image too on the screen, this is nine different churches within a one mile radius in Oak Cliff down here in South Dallas. The designer that took this one over, it was his passion because he lives there. He passes by these churches every day on his way to work. And so he felt really passionate about it. And Oak Cliff's one of those communities, it's very active. It's about rebuilding itself, if you guys know it. And there are a lot of these communities around the country. So it's one of those things that, that's going on all over. So this is one of the typical buildings. We just, we took one, it was one that we're working on, actually as another project, so we had access to it. So we thought, well, let's use this as a case study. It's your standard layout though. It's got the, the old sanctuary and then the education building attached to it. So we thought, well, how can we transform that? You know, those buildings, they're very kind of closed in. They're not very open. The front doors face the main street. They don't face back into the church building itself. There's really not any kind of community space or atrium space or connection space. So how can we transform that? So the first thing we did when we looked at the buildings is to create the celebration space and try to transform that, turn it on itself. And then we created some connection space. We talked about that connection space being able to be for, for learning and for reaching out for that connection that we're talking about. You know, most of those buildings have very narrow corridors to so blow all that stuff out, make it a bigger thing. And then the community building, we talked about that really being the place that really starts to reach out to the, to the neighborhood, to the community. It's the place where you could do, you could set up micro businesses in there. You could do job training. You could, you could feed the hungry out of that. There's all kinds of things you could do. And then we talked about also how you could use the space around that building. You know, a lot of these have green space, but they're not really utilized green space and they have parking lots. Well, since we're gonna be able to stack cars together in 10 years, we won't have a problem with that. So we can take that over. So the idea of being able to plant community gardens and then use the community plaza. And really, like you're saying, Toby, it, it brings it back. It makes it the epicenter of the community. Something pretty exciting. So we'll just show you, this is a picture of the view and then this is what our designers did to it. They popped it open, they, they created clear story light in the room itself. They expanded the room, they took out the side aisles and they added uh, walkways around the outside. And then you can see what the community space could be like. It could be all kinds of activities. Then you also have the ability then to have farmers markets and, and local people bring produce. And that could be the place again, it's used for other purposes, it's not used just for worship. Then again, like we said, the community garden out back. And so then when we looked at the worship room, again, it had a fixed choir, uh, baptistry down the center. Thought you can really start to transform that as well. Like we said, we can pop it up. In this case, this building had trusses. We could expose those trusses, let in a lot of natural light. Get it to go to the next slide. And completely transform that room. It doesn't have to have a fixed stage. In this case, we're doing it more in the round style. And the technology also, you'll see there's not very much technology in there. Well, technology is shrinking. It's there, you just can't see it. Well, that's before they asked my input, by the way, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> it's invisible. Yes, this is the constant yeah. tension. But we sure, we sure will get more efficient. Yeah, as the architects technology. push on these guys. That's what you were telling us the other day. Yeah. Two, two pound visible. screens is what Tom said. Two yeah. pound screens. Two pounds. Right, exactly. The other thing we find is interesting is that, you know, this whole notion of two screens has kind of become the, the standard, but really you can project on any service in the room. And once you can do that with digital mapping, you can really make the space anything you want it to be. In this case, it becomes a forest. So you can have your service in the forest. The other no, thing no is more skipping Sunday to yeah. go to the... One of the things that's interesting to note is the, uh, the tendency to move towards creating spaces that surround rather than present. A yeah. movement away from a culture that is, is a didactic message of presentational, us here to you, but right. there, everything's in the around. 
and yeah. that's a, a, a strong trend. Interesting too that a lot of our schemes came back to being in the round. So we'll get into that in a minute too. Global church again, the idea that you could have a church that uh, could go in any environment <coughs> really, in areas that are under-resourced, no infrastructure. Uh, might be a situation too where we've got an American congregation that's partnering with a local church. So how do you get materials to them that, that can be utilized, you know, in an effective way versus the old idea, which is if you've been on those mission trips to build buildings around the world, very labor intensive again, but we're building old style of buildings. Right. The designers uh, for this one, they started playing with the idea of shipping containers. And we said, well, go a little further than that. We've all done shipping container projects if you're architects. So we okay. talked about what are materials that could be of use to us in the future here for this kind of thing. How could you create a material that could become structure, but it also is the package. So you could literally ship it around the world, piece it together there, and make something of it. We talked about mold-injected fiber-reinforced plastic. And there's no short term for that, so I'm only going to say it once. <laughs> but it's a really cool material. The fact is you can put pieces together, you can glue it together, and it's as strong as steel. So once you get it out on site, you can make anything of it. The other thing, too, is it's hollow, so it can hold water. And water scarcity is a huge issue. And so if we can use this building to not only support a structure, but to filter water and to provide water for people there, and also provide electricity by attaching photovoltaic panels to it, it does a lot more things than just being a building. And that's one of the things we're really excited about. This is a diagram of one of the photovoltaic panels in the structure. You can see too, the structure is what it is, but you can infill it with thatch, you can infill it with whatever local material is available. So it's pretty exciting what you can do with it. So this is a diagram showing it. The packages are dropped on site. They begin to be assembled. The water wall is assembled. The structure for the enclosure is, is put up. And then it begins to be able to be adapted to many uses. This is just a shot of it in a, in a site somewhere in the world. You can see the photovoltaic panels, the view into it. And then again, like we said, it offers those kind of community services. It becomes the center of the community there whether it be medical needs, dental needs, it could be di disaster relief, a lot of really cool things that you could do with this. This is a view of the water wall and as you would walk into the project. And they had to do an animation of some sort there. Yeah, we had to animate it, of course. Yeah. The celebration room, the worship room, we left that open air. One of the things, Tom, you, you mentioned this. Interesting story your friend told you. Oh, well, just relative to the, the debate in Africa many times is, it, I guess, so much about the style of building is should we have a building? Should we have a roof? Yeah. <laughs> should it be open air? Certainly, it makes more sense to, to take advantage of the natural climate Yeah. Uh, and utilize that. So all of these do that. The idea, too, though, is that when you go to these places, I mean, they want the same things we have here. They want that energy. They want that worship experience. And so if we can provide the power, we can provide that experience. And again, as we shrink technology and it becomes more adaptable to these places and takes less electricity, it's going to be great, you know. Imagine <laughs> what we can put there. Yeah. <laughs> Flexible place. The idea, again, that you have that, uh, I guess the old term is kit of parts, and we just wanted to go beyond that. Yeah. Every pastor wants the ultimate flexibility, we found. Uh, but what if we approached it, again, taking building systems, many of which, you know, exist today, frankly, uh, and think of it like a Lego. What's more flexible than a Lego system? Right. So as we look at this, you're going to see we started with a basic kind of uh, structural grid that's used for warehouses. Yeah. See the By the way, this is my boss's scheme. So yeah. Everybody, let's get, let's, let's, let's hear like, oh, it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they love it, Rick. Uh, it's a 45-foot module, though, uh, in terms of the, the structural bay, about 28 feet tall. So you could put a single story or two floors within that. The idea again though, it's, it's, it's fully flexible and adaptable each, within each one of those bays and even spanning beyond bays. Right. You see a worship set up there for about 500 people uh, and then very easily that can be adapted again in a room in the round to about a thousand. Yeah. But then the idea is this is a 500 seat room. Again, you can project on any surface. Then as you expand that to the 1000 seat room. Yeah. And again, if you think about it, so much of our room design now is driven by the idea again that where the, the, uh, the speaking position needs to be, where the screens need to be. But if all the, the walls essentially are a projection surface, yeah. uh, and again, we can go to an idea of in the round and people have that connection 
with the speaker, it, it provides a lot more opportunity here. Yeah, you don't have to worry about the column so much. Yeah. And then the leftover spaces are really those connection spaces, those spaces outside the center, the worship center. Yeah. Yeah, I deal with the technology too, is we don't, uh, in the classroom in the future, we're not really confined by those kind of four-walled areas. Uh, yeah. In fact, they take place wherever. Right. And then the exterior skin, it doesn't have to be tilt up. It could be, you know, modular panels like this that could be disassembled and reassembled, so you can add on to it as you need to, or take parts of, parts of the building down. And of course, this is the pastor's car. It's the, the car of the future. Yes. Yeah. We had to have that. Yeah. Be very affordable. Very affordable. We also talked about how you could site this really anywhere. And in this case, this is a, uh, a typical warehouse site. So the idea, too, is that if the church grows beyond capacity of this building, you convert it back to warehouse use. So it's easily adaptable to other uses. Urban church. Uh, again, with so many churches going back to the urban areas and, and trying to adapt to that, uh, it's a huge challenge. I think one of the first uh, slides we're going to show here uh, is, is, is from our experience in Korea, one thing that we did grow used to is the idea that you could stack churches and, and work vertically uh, with the worship space, uh, learning spaces, c community spaces. Uh, and so that was one of the first things we, uh, the team looked at was existing office buildings, which there's lots of empty office space. And I suspect will be more and more of that in the future. Yeah. Uh, so that was the first thing to look at. Although one of the great challenges with this, we found again in practicing in Korea, is how do you get a large room for celebration, for worship, uh, in an existing building with low floor-to-floor -floor heights? Uh, and so as this, as this team looked at it, they came up with a novel solution to it also, which we're going to see next. Yeah. They basically said, well, why couldn't we use a parking garage? Let's put it up on top of the parking deck. And we said, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Let's do it. So we took over the parking garage. This is a building in downtown Dallas. And then also, we thought that wasn't enough space. Let's use a vacant building that's next door to it. Again, it's following that Korea model. So you can see some of the uses. We still keep the parking there. You still would need some parking. But then as you move up the parking ramps, you get into the gathering space. And then the worship space on top, that was another really cool idea. They actually used the natural slope of the garage for the worship space. And you can bridge over to the learning uh, building. Yeah. I'd say too, taking advantage of these connecting these uh, via rooftop gardens as yeah, well. Yeah. So every space in the urban area is uh, adaptable. Right. And then the idea too of, of these, these gathering spaces being able to be multifunctional. Yeah. These yeah. are on the parking ramps. In fact, you can see you could drive your car right up and up into the, uh, the worship area. You could area. drive your future car right up on stage yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is a view back then looking towards the stage. And again, once you're up on top of a garage, you can have all the natural lights you want. Sorry, we had to trick up the presentation. Yeah. And then again, it can transform into to really any environment that you want it to be. But it does really become that beacon, you know, to downtown. And again, like we talked about the epicenter, it can be the epicenter of downtown, of a revitalized downtown. The last one is the found place. This is around the idea, if you can imagine, a, uh, the modern version of the Old Testament tabernacle. People of God really moving wherever he is. And if, in, a, in its purest sense, I guess, if you got down to the idea that the church is on mission, it is missional, that it isn't defined by a building, it's, it's wherever it, it's found yeah. is where the church is, right? Wherever you are is where the church is. Right. And so the idea that a church, uh, this is the ultimate kind of church on a, in a box, uh, it can go wherever it needs to, whether that's under a city bridge feeding the homeless, or it's going to Joplin, Missouri to minister to people in need there, uh, or over the, around the world. But thinking about, again, what kind of structures might be available in the, in the future to afford that kind of flexibility. So the guys jumped out a little bit here on the yeah. sci-fi end of things. Yeah, this was, we called this one the Batman Church. And one of our designers was like, what if it was like the Batman cape? You remember that? You could electrify it, and it took shape, and it would become a wing. And we're like, well, that's cool. And he goes, yeah, it's actually a real material. It's called memory-shaped polymer. And NASA's developing it. Yeah. We're like, okay, yeah, we can get into that. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So really, it could take any shape. And then they really went out with it. I, I thought it yeah. was a cool scheme. Yeah. Yeah. 
The idea that those materials then can be rolled up, packed yeah. in the back of trucks. Yeah, future you, trucks, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Oval wheels. And by the way, this is kind of the worship mob, okay, you just tweet where you're gonna be that week, and right. so that's where the trucks go and your, yeah. your congregation shows up. Yeah, you roll it out, you unpack it, electrify it, it takes whatever shape you want it to take. And then the skin itself can actually adapt too, depending on what the conditions are. Yeah. You wanna say biomimicry? Yes, biomimicry. <clears throat> I didn't want to really get into that, but yeah. <laughs> you can look that up later. <laughs> exactly. But the idea too then is you can, uh, the structure is one part of it, but you can also do it for the floor. So you could unroll the floor, you could create the risers, you could create the spaces as well as a second part of this. And so then we adapted it into this dome shape. You see the worship room in the middle of it then. So the celebration space is at the heart of this. And it really is in many ways like an electrified tent. And then again, the perimeter spaces become those connection spaces. But you really can put this anywhere. We talked about you don't necessarily need to roll, roll out the floor. You could just use the stadium. You could use stadium seating and actually have the the enclosure as part of that. Or you could drop it in the middle of New York City and Rockefeller Center. Yeah, we like this one actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it really could go anywhere. The true occupation here. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, we've got to have the Batman cross, right? right. It's got to light up in the sky. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. So those are five adaptions, five places we saw and our team saw as the future church going. Um, we'd really like to think that this, this last uh, quote here is kind of the way we approached it. Uh, if you look back in, in, in church history, I won't go too far off, off track here, I promise, Michael. Okay. But, uh, I mean, churches have been leaders in how they've utilized building technologies, artistic ideas. You look at the, the Gothic cathedrals, those really were cutting edge, and they still stand to this day as real testaments to the, you know, the ingenuity of, of those engineers, those artists, but the churches, too, that had that kind of vision, pushed that. Uh, and so we'd like to think that these ideas although certainly not all of them may be achievable. We'll come back in 10 years and talk about it, yeah. how it worked out. But you know, we'd like to challenge conventional thinking in terms of, of we as architects, but as churches too, to think what might your building really look like. Right. So now for the panel, they've been sitting patiently here. A uh, few questions. Let's go to the sacred space question. Me? And we've heard Toby's opinion. Yeah. <laughs> but what does sacred space look like in the future? Because I didn't see many buildings here that look like things we typically have called sacred space. So what is it? We had, a, we had an interesting dialogue when we were meeting the other day about what is sacred space. And, and uh, we, we have, as consultants, we have the opportunity to work with, uh, we've worked with some 500 churches. And so we work with views across the divide um, and, and, and usually very strong views on what sacred space is. And I think one of the things that we're, we're grappling with the tension as we look to the future is how do you balance uh, the sense of mission which is fighting against the sense of spending a great deal of money uh, which leading in some respects uh, when we talk about the churches being highly missional is just spending a lot less money uh, which often leads people let's just put a church in a, in a box let's just go grab some kind of really crummy found space and we'll just paint the walls black and shove a couple of lights in and off we go uh, and I think one of the things the design teams are spending a lot of time working on is thinking through how do we create a space of beauty and recognize that low cost does not equate uh, compromise in creating the experience that people can connect emotively to each other and emo emotively in a worship environment. So my answer would be that sacred space is about creating a space that people can connect to God. Um, and it's not people are going to have different answers. Some for that's a, ch a chapel that has a very you know steep angled roof, and others not. But it's generally speaking, in my view at least, and, and Toby uh, may have a different take on this. Yeah. Uh, what most people would say is sacred space. It's not a space that is just a black box uh, with ugly floors. Uh, right. So I don't know, Toby. <laughs> yeah, I think some guys I know like they hold ugly as a badge of honor like we're more spiritual than you because our place is ugly right I, 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 I don't i don't really you know i don't i don't agree with that i, I you know i don't want a white i don't want my creative team meeting in a room this white walls i want something that stimulates creativity i think that's true in a church 
I just think, well, you got to understand, man, my church started in a bar. And so when you start in the back of a bar, you kind of redefine sacred space. Most people come and had been at the bar the night before. You know, that's yeah, how they found yeah. us. And, and then we built a barn because we didn't have any money. Yeah. And literally a barn builder, we drew it up and Denny's on a napkin. Sorry, it's what we did. <laughs> and just can you build a barn like you built at my house, bigger, insulated, and just put air conditioning in it. Right. So I've always had kind of a, I'm, I'm never like badge of honor that it's ugly. All of those places, there were some endearing qualities, some some we might beauty in the eyes of the holder but right. beauty in it I, I just think for me it's the concept of man if god's there it's sacred so let's so i'm okay with that and i don't i'm because of heritage for me i want to be as flexible as i can so i don't want to say well we can't do anything in that room because that's a sacred space like we dismiss mm-hmm. god after the last song so we can't use this room to do other things yeah. So th- that's where sacred space for me changes. It for me, I always have heard it as, well, you know, that's the holy of holies there. So that we got to have that. Then we can have all this other stuff. And I'm like, well, why can't you do both right. in that same space? Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I've often thought it's about the experience too. It's that when you walk into a beautiful church, you go, wow. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's that wow factor to it. That's what connects me a lot of times as an architect too. Well, and I have three spiritual. campuses in three very distinct communities. Yeah. And, you know, one is a sprung structure. Well, there's nothing pretty about a sprung, sprung structure. <laughs> right. We have that. And then one was one we purchased that was it's really nice. And then one's the conversion, like the first one you did. So mm-hmm. I've got three distinctly different environments all matching their community yeah. and all being utilized in different ways. Like I'm... I'm I got the mic so you get to hear my opinion. I'm out on a flat. On a, I'm out on a slow floor building. Right. Yeah. Because it starts limiting what you can do in that room. That's, yeah. And for me, that's the only reason. Yeah. I want flat floor if I can possibly get it. Yeah. Because I can use that room to do a lot of the other things I want to do Monday through Saturday in that space. Yeah. Mm. It's interesting. Tom and I got into this debate. I don't want to go too far into it because I know we really got off in the weeds. But <laughs> this notion of of a spiritual space, could technology be the thing that infills that? Could an immersive environment be what makes that space feel more spiritual? You set it up that way. So for instance, we showed you some images of a Gothic cathedral. By projecting that onto a white box, does that make it, or does that help it to feel more spiritual when you walk into it? What do you guys think? I'm the technology guy, so we can do that. and We can create absolutely <laughs> magical environments. Uh, I think there's a risk of making it a theme park ride. Right. And uh, I think so. There, there's that danger of, of the most profound building spaces have a longevity to them that you walk in and you go, I, th- th- it's got a solidity to it, you walk in and, and that's what it is. It's this week, it's next week. And I think most people uh, find that's got some sort of reassurance to it. From a technology point of view, we can do unbelievable things and do do unbelievable things. We're doing stuff in performing arts centers now that you couldn't imagine would have happened in a traditional performing arts center just five years ago of now being accepted. But in general, I think that there's, while we like to do it and we get a kick out of doing it, I, I think there's a caution about kind of losing the plot somewhere along the line. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, the role of technology in the future church. I mean, we joked about uh, our desire to make it disappear and, and yeah. certainly can move that way, but what is that proper balance? Well, I, you know, I, it, leading on from what I've just said, I think that technology exists to facilitate, not to lead. And um, and so if you look at what the future is, the, the future is really uh, following where culture is going and how you're going to facilitate ministry. And so, you know, one of the sayings we have in the house is that, you know, the, the last 10 years, the next big thing has been the next bigger thing. And so the next 10 years, our belief is the next big thing is not the is is not the next bigger thing, and so what is it? Uh, and I, I'd say there's probably a couple of things. The, the first thing is that it's taking, it's breaking down the gap between. And I'm going to be centric to the the worship space for a second. Otherwise, we kind of lose the plot of time here. Um, the first thing is to break down the the gap between, say, what we're doing here and where you guys are out there, mm-hmm. uh, and that's and you're seeing a lot of that now with projecting on the walls. And so it isn't just simply I have uh, what I'm communicating on the walls behind me. We're now enveloping people, creating enveloping environments. We're changing the way the room is designed. 
uh, so, so that people aren't saying, I, you know, it's the, the sage from the stage experience. Uh, it's now we, we're connecting people together. We're breaking down that gap. That's something that's been done in performing arts for many years, by the way. You know, churches are much later to that game. Uh, I'd say the second thing is moving from orchestra to jazz. And I don't mean stylistically. Uh, churches have pre-programmed -pre everything they do, and they call themselves interactive. But most <laughs> churches, and I'd say 95% of the churches uh, out there, have such a pre-programmed planned issue that if the congregation didn't come, nothing different would occur. Uh, which means it's a classical, in other words, it's scored, it's a totally scored music. Jazz is different. Jazz is completely improvisational. No less skillful, no less pre-practiced, and so we see churches moving to jazz. That The reason a lot of the churches are classical is it's very hard to do jazz unless you've got the technical competency to be able to back it up. You can't just pull up a different uh, scripture on the, on the screen, you can't just pull up different music. Now, some of that's happening, but we can go much more advanced on that. Yeah. I won't take the time. But if you go to any of the major league sports facilities and you watch the fact that someone comes up to bat wasn't expected, their stats come out on the screen like bat. They have all of the backup. This stuff happens in sports. Sports is jazz. What we do in church continues to be classical. So the technologies exist. I see we're going to see that. The third thing is dialogue. We don't have di We talk about dialogue, but we don't do it. Technology enables that. So I imagine, for example, the capacity for the pastor to say, how are you doing this morning? And people write on the walls, how are they doing digitally? And you'd be a texting or literally scribing, an artist describing the wall. Tell me about your, your, your tough times in, in your marriage. And in other words, testimonies happening digitally on the wall. So there's an engagement and a participation. That's doable right now. We don't have to wait mm -hmm. for the future. Culturally, we're not ready for that. But the, the, there's a number of processes and we can go down that path. The fourth one I would say, is personalization. We continue to say one size fits all in our current presentation, mm -hmm. uh, but the technologies are now moving to the point where we can personalize messages. In other words, uh, I can have my iPhone or my iPad and it can relate to me in the way I want to see things. Because we continue to, you know, I mean, Toby, you face this, of course, you know, the front row may be someone who's been a Christian for five minutes, the back row, someone who's never been a Christian, never been inside a church, third row, someone who's been a, got a PhD. Uh, there's no reason not to personalize their position on this device by what they're receiving while you're speaking with a broad range of competencies and that might be a projection of, uh, of data of literally Greek translation, uh, Wikipedia information, uh, pushing scriptures. Some of this by the way I've got because I'm going to do a shout out to him. Uh, Jared Chambers from uh, Preston Trail gave me a couple ideas this last week on some of these things. but. Um, there's a lot of stuff we can do with technologies that allow this engagement to personalize. I think the personalization thing, by the way, is a big deal. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'll stop there and we could go on and well, would go good. on. Well, good stuff. <laughs> Let me jump in with one more question then we're going to throw it, I think, out to the audience for some Q&A, I believe, here because we're running up against time. But uh, uh, looking at the ideas out there, and I'm going to go out on a limb here a little bit, Michael, expose Michael and I, but the assumption, any of the assumptions you see in the designs that didn't make sense to you in terms of what you really see in the church? Or did we hit a home run here relative to these designs? Come on, slam us. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we got together this last week and we kind of you know, did our own hug kumbaya moment about how clever we all were. <laughs> and one of our team members was with us, with us and we, we went in the car afterwards. I said, Steve, what do you think? I don't know if Steve's sits standing here. I don't know if he's here. In any event, yeah. and, and he said, well, the only concern I would have is, is this portable to other cultural settings, mm. um, the way you're thinking about some of these things, and I'm, I'm not sure yet. I'm not completely sure. Mm. Uh, I, need to think, I need to think that through uh, a bit. Yeah. Um, some of the architecture is, but I think some of the thinking of how to relate um, uh, is, is, is a challenge. I mean, for example, the, the um, uh, micro-business context for I come from Africa uh, and that, that would be that's not consistent with how that might work in a, in a church there so I'm, I'm still thinking that through okay Toby well I, we're a multi-site church so I'm always thinking in terms of multi-site and I think going sound like a broken record but w what I'm looking for in that is multi-use out of your largest space that you've invested your most money into that that's for me the, the big deal is can I can I build smaller square footage and get more utilization 
because we're I mean I get the separation but I want to see how we can marry those two together how can this space be this space when we gather to celebrate but it can be this space when we do this and this and this and I think I think that's what we're gonna have to think through okay Michael anything you comment. look at now and go I wish we would have thought of this no it's all great <laughs> <laughs> it is it's awesome stuff yeah, it's cool. yeah. I don't know if anyone realized, but there's a whole bunch of, the, I think it's a blog page that's, that the guys are putting together. There's a bunch of stuff we've seen that I, I'm just in awe at how much work was went into, because I didn't do it, yeah. uh, to pull this off. It's just a fantastic amount of work. Well, I'll go ahead and put in the plug here. I mean, there are cards pick up here. There's a, a blog. we Because there was so much content that the teams came up with, there was just no way we knew we could plow through it in this kind of a session. So. And, and we would like to definitely keep the conversation going relative right. to thoughts of others, so that blog will give you that opportunity. Don't have a mic or anything to go around, so just have to speak up. Yeah, this won't go. That yeah, won't we, reach far. We can repeat your question. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. That, that is a great question, and that is the question, by the way. Uh, uh, his question is about multi-site, and if you're three different sites in three different places, are they, are they all different? Is there, a, is there a central theme to it? The word we use is DNA, the DNA of our church. It plays out different in all three places. I've got one church in a very affluent area. I've got one church that, that is in kind of the suburbs, country, you know, Ride a, ride a horse, kick a cow kind of deal. And then, like, I can say this about my one side in Denton. I mean, Denton's weird, man. I mean, it's Austin wannabe. Let's hug a tree, eat some bark, you know. Weird. <laughs> and paint with your feet, you know. And so, I kind of like weird, so it's, it's cool with me. But, so you got these three different cultures, right? And the greatest compliment that people give when they come to tour, our, do a Sunday tour and see our thing is that it, it's all expressed in different ways. But it's it's the same DNA. You can tell it's cross timbers, and so there has to be a, a central level of here's our values. These can play out and look differently in every area as long as I'm a huge believer in. We have to have clearly stated values. This makes us who we are, and it may be expressed. You know, in Denton, and I'm not kidding. Maybe in the worship you're going to paint with your feet over there, and we ain't going to do that in Argyle because they're going to laugh at us and bring their horses in. But as long as one of our values is is uh, passionate worship, however that plays out in that culture, that's okay. And so that's a that is the question, and I think it's the greatest battle of multi-site. Yeah, it's a great one. Yeah, makes it hard. Actually, we're gonna have another session here at 4:30 on multi-site. We're gonna be talking about some of those those issues. Yeah. Great question. Who else? Any other questions? Question is, what would have to happen to make that global church concept happen? <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw that, that around here. Well, I mean, there are things that you can do already. You can, we can ship materials. Uh, this particular material that we were talking about, I mean, it's, it's still being developed, so it's not accessible yet. But that's part of, you know, the fun of what we do is sometimes you, you put it out there and try to figure out how to develop it and how to make it something possible. But if, again, if you're not just talking about building materials and all that, yeah. talking about technology, yeah. last year we we're partnered with some churches in Mumbai, India, and I preached there, and we and we had a obviously a few hour time difference tape delay, but it was I preached there and in here, mm -hmm. and so you had I'm big in the technology of Slingbox, and we can see each other in both places, yeah. and I think as we begin to think about it, how can we connect people together and help people here feel connected more than we're just sending money to that place over there. I think technology is gonna play a huge part in helping, the, you know, I got three campuses that can feel together. Well, technologically, I can feel together with the church that's meeting on the other side of the world. Right. And I mean, that was a huge, huge win for us. And I can say that because I didn't think it up, but I mean, it was unbelievable what happened when those two churches felt like they were worshiping together. Right. My, my answer, my answer would be, I, I think it'd be awesome for 
some churches to work together with some uh, either architectural teams or with architectural uh, uh, universities, with architectural groups to fund uh, some of these projects uh, to build some of these elements. And that's, that's not atypical. I mean, you know, right. Michael ad addressed this. He said, you don't, you're not an architectural student unless you've done some of these projects. Right. Uh, and so a number of these exercises are being done uh, in, uh, in needy communities uh, for food and, I mean, for, for uh, uh, I'm trying to think, for restrooms that are being built in these kind of package units. And there's no reason for churches not to fund these. And that's a much more lasting element than sending someone over for a, a yeah. three week period of time, which is, you know, I, I think this is something that could really sustain for years. Um, you yeah. know, $200,000 investment uh, could just impact a community for a decade. You yeah. know, that's one of the things that we're exploring is prefabrication. And the fact that we're also a construction company allows us to do that kind of research and development and try to figure those things out. So when we put these things out there, they're not that far away, really. We can get to it pretty quickly. And that was true with any of the ideas, especially the technology ideas. I mean, everything that the team's put forward is information. It's, it's technology yeah. that's out there. It's the application of that. It's bringing those things together in the right way, and who knows? Maybe a church, maybe a businessman, a Christian businessman can get behind an idea like that and push a technology to develop something that could help a global church. Yeah. That would be pretty exciting. Yeah. Radio stations, Christian radio stations have been planted all over uh, the world in a similar fashion. They kind of pop up radio stations. So it's not much different from that. Yeah. Any other questions? Can we go to the last slide, Michael? Oh, sure. We can get there. It needs to wake up. Yeah. Again, we want to thank you for attending. And uh, we've got cards down front that will have the, uh, the web address, where we'll have the uh, blog uh, for the future church. Uh, we'd love you to participate in the conversation. Talk to us afterward. We're going to be around. Have a great time at WFX and uh, go out and make the future, right? All right. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you.